The topic is gut microbiota, diet, and cholesterol. Gut, the intestines, uh, actually produce a number of beneficial, health beneficial um, substances. Some of them are neurotransmitters. What is a neurotransmitter? It is something that transmits a signal to you through the nervous system. Okay, so it's also a connection between what we absorb and what we actually stimulate in terms of the nervous system. And also it produces hormones. And last time also we discussed, and I indicated that it is important for the um, balance between recirculation and excretion of hormones like estrogen. It also provides um, the right conditions for microbiota um, to, uh, as an environment for them to flourish. And of course, it's extremely important that the beneficial ones um, are, are maintained within the intestines. And this is one of the main aspects of this gut health series. Metabolites, which are substances that are produced from nutrients um, and that are both beneficial and harmful, and of course, the balance between this microbiota and the right balance would result in beneficial metabolites. If there is an imbalance, so there is what we call the dysbiosis, then, then we would have harmful metabolites. So that's an overview of the previous presentations. We also stated previously that um, the there are factors that impact the actual gut microbiota, what these microbes that are present in the gut, in the intestines, are um, changed due to various factors. And uh, we mentioned in, in terms of, of at the beginning of, um, of, of the life cycle, all right, there's the bread process, which affects it, the actual type of feeding method. And then eventually, there is stress and diet, uh, which may, has a high, high impact on the microbiota and the balance of the microbiota. And there is also the pharmaceuticals and medicines that we take. Geography is important and also the life cycle stages. I mean, the aging process, which impacts on the balance of these microbiota. But today we are going to focus on diet we actually measure the abundance and the diversity of this microbiota. And we also defined dysbiosis in the previous sessions, which is the imbalance. You, that, that means that the bacterial abundance and diversity in the large intestine is not in balance. It's not in balance. And therefore, the health promoting metabolites or substances that we produce are affected negatively. And in fact, we see that we mentioned few metabolites um, last time. We mentioned the short chain fatty acids as one of the most beneficial metabolites that are required for our human body. And this, these are the type of metabolites that we as human cells are not capable to produce. And we require specific types of bacteria, of microbiota in our gut to produce these compounds. So in case of dysbiosis, um, the short chain fatty acids are low. There is a, a low amount of production of these and this would come, that would impact on our health. Also, we mentioned specific bacteria that are important for the mucus layer, which is extremely important in our gut. And in case of dysbiosis, this is also very narrow wise it should be a thick mucus layer. Because of all these and because of disruption of the tightness and the integrity of the gut lining, which is only one cell thick, then we have passive entrance of bacteria and their harmful substances towards our tissues from the hollow tube, which I repeat myself, it is an external tube from the um, mouth to the anus. So when there is passive, when I say passive means all, all nutrients, if everything is healthy and the cell lining integrity is fine, 
nutrients do not just pass through, but they are actively um, transported towards our blood system. If the, the cell membrane, the cell lining, the gut cell lining is um, um, disrupted, then of course this becomes a passive intake. And in addition to the beneficial substances, we would have a lot of toxins and bacteria that come in, which would result in an increase in inflammation um, in, uh, and chronic inflammation, which can be um, sort of sustained. And there is also the possibility of microbial translocation, which means that the microbes will actually enter our tissue and we would have a risk, high risk of infection. Now, this dysbiosis triggered, is triggered by various factors, as I said before, so the age, diet, stress, medication, and the presence of pathogenic microbes. Now we're going to focus on the, um, uh, the factor, which is diet today. And uh, various scientific interventions have been, have been done in healthy populations. Um, and it is very clearly scientifically that when one changes from, for instance, a Mediterranean diet in which there is the high abundance and diversity of health promoting bacteria and low abundance of pro-inflammatory bacteria. When I say pro means it, um, it is um, in favor of, uh, it would result in inflammation. Um, that means that Mediterranean diet is one of the best diets to, uh, to, to suppress the risk for cardiovascular disease, CVD, inflammation, diabetes, and obesity, and most of the metabolic syndromes. On the other hand, the Western diet, that is the, the total opposite. We have an increase in pro-inflammatory um, bacteria and also very low uh, amounts and abundances of bacteria that are beneficial um, in our intestines. And therefore, there, there is a huge disbalance in metabolites and health promoting metabolites in our system. Okay? So there's a big difference. Now, we have always to pay attention to, um, uh, to therapeutic diets. Um, therapeutic diets, like if there's somebody who is celiac, of course, they, they, um, that person cannot take gluten, um, and they shouldn't take gluten. Um, but gluten-free diet also uh, sort of increases the pro-inflammatory um, pro status. And in fact, gluten-free diet should be supported by supplements to reduce that. And I will give you some example on, on terms of diet, what one can do if the um, anti-inflammatory bacteria are, um, are low in abundance. Okay, so there are various, there are various issue, um, methods to increase the anti-inflammatory bacteria also in these therapeutic diets. What I'm saying is therapeutic diets should be given to the actual individuals that require them. A lot of studies have compared the, the, the effect on the metabolites between within a healthy cohort, healthy, healthy cohorts. A cohort means it's a group of individuals that go into a study. So healthy individuals. Um, and healthy individuals can have an animal-based um, diet or a plant-based diet. And that is one of the um, biggest comparison in terms of studies, scientific studies that have proven that diet is related to specific changes in metabolites. And I just uh, showing you a figure here, a, an image that um, I took from the last, uh, last, last month's presentation in which to define the metabolites, okay? So metabolites, we're talking about the production of secondary bile acids, which is the purple part, the actual fermentation, the green part, fermentation of carbohydrates and other substances into the short chain fatty acids, the production of bioactive compounds, 
the, the regulation of the immune responses and also degradation of specific amino acids to produce health promoting compounds such as the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin or indole. Of course, in terms of dysbiosis, we have to pay attention to the entrance of passive entrance of toxins and other polysaccharides that are have a negative impact on our health. So those are the main metabolites that we discussed um, last month. So this comparison between animal-based and plant-based uh, diets, we studies show um, that there are alterations in these metabolites, specifically in the secondary bile acids and the production of um, short-chain fatty acids, which are totally different between these two diets. So basically, diet definitely affects the host and the microbial metabolome, meaning it affects the microbes. And as I said in January's uh, presentation, the microbes represent more um, proteins, active proteins that are important to change nutrients into beneficial substances. And we call that in total the metabolome, which is basically the overall metabolites in a specific time in a specific individual. Now, of course, the diff main difference between animal-based and plant-based is the intake of fiber. And we know that fiber intake has a positive correlation with, with, with short-chain fatty acids because this is the fermentation of fiber into these beneficial compounds. And therefore, this is one of the major difference between the two diets. So definitely diets affect the metabolites of an individual. What's interesting is that if somebody changes from one diet to the other, this change in metabolites, we can see this after around two days, three days. But if they go back to the previous diet, the changes will revert back within a shorter time period. That's because um, the, the, there are specific enterotypes in different geographic regions. But that is, um, that is something to discuss in another session. Okay, so let's dig in into the cholesterol issue in terms of gut microbiota diet and cholesterol. First of all, as usual, I define some specific terms. Um, and, um, and if you need to ask any questions, please always ask throughout the presentation um, if you need some definitions, additional definitions. So um, when we say lipid, um, so uh, lipid is also known as fatty acid, okay? It's basically a molecule, a substance which is absorbed, and it is fatty, okay? It has a fatty component, all right? Those are called lipids, like, for instance, oils, okay? Um, and we will be discussing the lipid intake and their metabolism and why cholesterol is increased in some specific um, diets. Now, I will take you through slowly. I know that sometimes it might be look difficult, it looks difficult, but um, bear with me. And if you have any questions, please stop me and ask. Now, if you look at the fatty acids that we consume via diet, these are not all the fatty acids, but these are the main ones, okay? There are those that we call saturated fatty acids. Maybe you can see it on the labels of your food items. There will be saturated or monosaturated or polysaturated. Okay, what does this mean? These are just different fatty acids. The saturated ones like palmitic acid and stearic acid, okay? They are still fat molecules, all right? Um, then there is ole oleic acid, which is what we call omega-9. So now we start thinking about the term omegas, okay? Linoleic acid, which is omega-6. Alpha-linoleic acid, so there are different types of fatty acid, but this one is omega-3. I'm not going through all these. Today, we will mainly mention the alpha-linoleic acid, which is, has a very direct um, interest in, in restoration of cholesterol. 
So ALA, alpha linear acid, okay, the omega-3, which is of main interest in the cholesterol. But what is also very important is we're going to talk about the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3. Now, that ratio, okay, is indicating the, the, the summation, uh, the, when you add all these omega-3s, as you can see, there is more like EPA and DHA, these are also omega-3, and the presence of omega-6, which is Arachan AA and others. Okay, so we look at, put them together and we do a ratio out of these, which is extremely important for the health of the cells. And keep this in mind, okay, so if, if cells are not healthy, and because the health of these cells are dependent on the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, and also because the gut lining is only one cell tick, okay, it's extremely important to, if we need to restore the gut lining, first we need to set the lipid profile in balance. And when we say lipid profile is actually this that you see in front of you, these particular lipids should be in balance. What we know is that only 5% of the individuals that are tested for omega-3 and omega-6 have a ratio less than the optimal ratio. Now, the optimal ratio, according to WHO, it's 5 is to 1. According to science, it's 3 is to 1. Okay, so science recommends that omega-6 is to omega-3 ratio as being 3 is to 1 or lower. If it is higher, then this particular balance uh, would result in disruption in cellular strength and also disruption in lipids, blood level lipids, which can result also in high LDL, which is a type of cholesterol. Okay, so very, um, I have only two slides here. So if you can think about the omega-3s, which are EPA, DPA, and DHA, um, the, the origin of these omega-3s are from fatty fish um, or from algae. All right, so algae as well, I'm showing a picture here. They also are full of omega-3. And you can actually um, have this dietary uh, intake for omega-3 supplementation. In terms of, so that was about EPA, DHA. In terms of ALA, alpha linolenic acid, which is extremely important as well for cholesterol balance, uh, we'll show you in a minute how. Um, in terms of ALA, which is an omega-3, these are the three types of uh, ingredients that are required in terms of diet. And of course, we're looking at spinach, blueberries, and also walnuts, okay? And linseed oils, and that's linseed, yeah. okay? So because I, before I delve in how we actually produce cholesterol from, uh, from our nutrients, I wanted also to define again more what are the types of lipids in our blood. So sometimes you go and have a, ideally frequently, you go and check your lipid, oh, your cholesterol level and your cholesterol level includes various information. It includes information about the cholesterol, includes information about HDL and LDL. So what are these HDL and LDL? First of all, lipids are not water soluble. Okay, so they cannot be, they are not miscible with water. And of course, blood, uh, where the lipids are actually circulating is mainly water. So the only way to lipid, for lipids to be present in blood is by them being coated with proteins, okay? And in fact, we call these lipoproteins, which means lipids and proteins together. And that's exactly what LDL is. It's lipoproteins with low density, meaning that they have low amounts of proteins. These are the bad lipids because they are circulating in our blood 
and they actually provide the cholesterol to the cells all over the body. So cholesterol is readily available from a low density lipoprotein and therefore LDL, high LDL means that there is a bad amount of lipids. High density, which they have a lot of proteins, um, on with, with, the, with the lipids, so it's a lipid protein mixture, but more proteins in it, high density. That's basically important because it removes cholesterol from the blood, transports it to the liver for disposal, for waste. So this is what we call the good lipids, the good lipoproteins. Okay? So the balance between LDL and HDL is extremely important. No. Okay, it might look, look very difficult, but don't, don't look at the detail. I just need the detail just to put the arrows together. Um, so diet is on your left. Yeah, so through diet, you get glucose. Yeah, and glucose, from glucose, you want to produce energy, which is then the bottom right. Okay, so this is basically what you need to do. Diet, glucose, energy. Now, a high intake of glucose, okay, would result in going through the red arrows. Yeah, it comes to the wheel. Okay, so it's like it's like uh, looking at a London Underground map here. Okay, so we're going to look at the red red um, line, and basically glucose will be converted via various metabolites towards this wheel, and that wheel is actually. Uh, it's really a wheel, okay? It's called a cycle, TCA cycle. And this is where um, uh, chemicals are being converted to, towards each other into and circulating in a cycle and produce energy. Okay? That's called the TCA cycle. So that's the red. But when we have a lot of glucose, okay, for instance, a high intake of carbohydrates, really high intake, okay, then we have enough to do, to go around with the wheel. Yeah, but also um, we actually start storing this additional um, glucose either via the blue arrow into glycogen, but also can be converted into fatty acids. Here they come again, fatty acids, and also adipose tissues, which are actually stores, as you can see like tanks, you know, stores of glucose in terms of glycogen and stores in terms of fatty acids. Um, on your right. So this is how, how energy is produced, but any extra intake that we take is going to be stored. And of course, if there's a high store of adipose tissue, this is what we need to um, take care of, okay? Glycogen stores are limited, um, but in terms of athletes, they need a lot of glycogen stores, okay? So we, are, we cannot generalize because it also depends on the lifestyle of the individual, okay? But ultimately, after all, diet needs to provide energy, okay? Now, we have a low glucose diet, a low carbohydrate diet here in front of us, okay? And when there's low carbohydrate, of course, there's low glucose, and therefore what happens is after various hours of low carbohydrate intake, one would start the green arrows and the blue arrows. So first, of course, the blue arrows, because it's the easiest. Okay, so the glycogen stores will start producing glucose, which well, we is, well, doesn't matter, type of glucose metabolite, and it will turn the wheel around. Okay, when the glycogen stores are depleted, one will start using adipose tissue, the fatty acids, so they will start generating fatty acids, and they will start to turn a little bit the wheel, but not as efficient. Okay, because there are some issues with inhibition. All right, there's some breaks on that. And they start producing ketone bodies and a lot of cholesterol. Okay, so this is important. But of course, this is a very important energy source because ketone bodies are very efficient energy sources as well. Okay, so this is to give you an idea, shifting of diets, we are doing also shifting of ways how to produce energy for our body cells, okay? When glucose levels are very low, okay, and but protein levels are very high, proteins are digested and we have amino acids like alanine and alanine is changed into glucose, okay? So that is a process 
which trig is triggered by high protein and low glucose. So in terms of lipid metabolism, it produces cholesterol um, during fasting. So the glycogen stores are used and are depleted. And after 12 hours, lipid catabolism, catabolism is breakdown of lipid, starts producing cholesterol and ketone bodies. The ketosis, which is the production of ketones, which means it's lipid breakdown, okay? This also results in altered gut microbiota in humans, and it has a positive impact on health, okay? So if we have low levels of a specific health-promoting bacteria, which is called Ackermansia that I mentioned in last month, one way to increase it is actually to um, induce fasting, okay? So there is, um, you, you reduce the glucose intake and start um, the lipid metabolism. The, the Ackermansia is also associated with ketosis, but also with metabolic improvement in humans. And we mentioned this last time. If you remember, this is a slide from uh, in uh, January, January session, where we show the importance of Ackermansia, which are these green sort of bacteria here on your, on your right. And the importance of this Ackermansia is to maintain a thick mu mucus layer. If you don't have these bacteria, then the mucus layer is very, is very thin, and we start having the leaky gut in which there is passive in, in, inflow of very toxic compounds and eventual inflammation. Um, if you look at the system where well, this is delivered, the red part is delivered, where cholesterol is used to produce bile acids. Bile acids are the emulsifier of fats. If during the diet there is fatty acids being um, uh, inputted, sort of as part of the diet, then bile acids are important because they emulsify. Now, at one point that those bile acids can be recirculated or excreted. It's very important for those people, for individuals that have high cholesterol, high LDL, is that this recirculation is minimized. Okay, so basically most of the bile acids should be excreted because if, if you recirculate bile acids, liver, the liver does not produce more bile acids if you recirculate them. Okay. And if they don't produce those bile acids, then the, they don't use cholesterol from the blood. And therefore, the LDL from the blood is maintained at a high level. So it's always important to excrete these bile acids so that liver will produce more and reduce the LDL load from the blood. Okay. So number one, a specific um, probiotic, which is a bacterium, Lactobacillus plantarum, okay? It's very important in the breakdown of bile salts in the gut, okay? And that's very important so that it's excreted and therefore the liver produces more bile acids and reduce the LDL from the bloodstream. So somebody who lacks this particular bacterium definitely have a high LDL. So, and thankfully, it's available as a probiotic. Um, which is an important aspect of inter an intervention on cholesterol lowering. In addition, L. plantarum, which is the same bacterium, of course, um, generates a short-chain fatty acids, which is propionic acid, and this actually suppresses cholesterol production in the liver. So again, not only uh, require, uses more cholesterol from the blood, but also reduces the production of cholesterol in the liver itself which is extremely important. And that's again through this health-promoting um, substance, the shown chit, fatty acid, propionic acid. El plantanum as well captures and metabolizes dietary sort of cholesterol in the gut, and therefore it's not absorbed, and therefore it reduces the amount of cholesterol in the blood. We look at four and five, four and five are in the red part, which is the liver, and six actually in the bloodstream, okay? In addition to, uh, to L. plantarum, and the addition of alpha linoleic acid in the diet, which is ALA, I mentioned it before, okay, which is an omega-3, down regulates the production of cholesterol in the liver. So in addition to L. plantarum, it's very important to give a prebiotic, which is called ALA, to reduce cholesterol production in the liver. And therefore, omega-3 is a good Polyunsaturated fat that improves the ratio of the lipids in the blood. Okay? 
and therefore it's important for healthy cholesterol levels. Together, l plantarum and omega-3 also reduce inflammation in the body, and that results in suppression of plaque, plaque formation in arteries. Plaque means that you feel narrowing of the arteries due to lipid deposits and cholesterol deposits in the arteries. Okay, so this is really a win-win situation um, in terms of supplementation of l plantarum and ALA for cholesterol lowering intervention in individuals with high cholesterol. This has been shown in intervention studies using individuals with high cholesterol. And these are clinical trials. So this graph is total cholesterol on the vertical axis and there is horizontal axis. If you give these particular probiotics and prebiotics, you can see that there's for an, an, a lowering of around 14% after three months. Okay? So this is the efficacy of cholesterol lowering intervention using L plantarum. In summary, omega-3 supplementation and L plantarum are important to keep LDL low. They also induce bile production in the liver and also suppress. Actually, another additional thing that I didn't mention, omega-3 also suppresses um, the production of glucose from amino acids that come from protein. So that's also um, reduces glucose production during um, high protein intake. Now, if we don't take care of these balances, balances both of lipid, but also balances of the microbiota in our large intestine, then we, then we have got dysbiosis, which we mentioned before, results in various pathogenesis. Um, so inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, anxiety, depression, hypothyroidism, and also autoimmune disease. Today, we can measure the dysbiosis index, to measure the amount of dysbiosis, and the scoring is one to five in this case, where we look at anti-inflammatory um, and also um, bacteria that maintain the, mu the mucus layer and also some health markers in terms of microbiota. One and two means it's non-dysbiotic, so it means it's in balance, good, in a good balance. Three is a mild disbalance, four and five is a severe disbalance. And of course, all these levels relate to um, specific clinical trials in which we know that about 16% of healthy populations have a mild dysbiosis, which is a score of three. Those that have in, um, inflammatory bowel syndromes, 70 to 80% have a, a profile, an index more equal to or more than three. And in inflammatory bowel disease, we see a very high and severe dysbiosis of four and five. And this index is related to health promoting metabolite production like butyrate, mucosa production, mucus layer, some markers like prostitutes, which is a definitely a gut health marker together with a carmansia, and also the inflammatory bacteria, which needs to be um, low. Yes, so we, we can restore um, gut health through restoring. Today, you understood why it's important to restore the lipid profile. Um, the importance of vitamins, because most vitamins, as we mentioned before in the January session, most vitamins are produced by bacteria and the dysbiosis would result in low vitamin levels. We have to look at the dysbiosis as an individual basis and, and re, re, that would result in a personalized um, dietary plan using prebiotics and probiotics depending on the individual's results. With that, I thank you for your patience.